We were looking at uh, the God's eternal decree this morning. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to, to just read a verse, and then I wanted to pray, um, and then we'll begin. This comes from Ephesians, um, Ephesians chapter, chapter 1, and it, it says that in Christ, in Him, we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. Let us pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for this revealed reality that You work all things according to the counsel of Your will. Lord, not according um, to our will, certainly according to our will at times. Father, we thank You for the way You've made Your will known to us and have made us love Your will and, and Your works and Your purposes. And yet at times those purposes are so mysterious and inscrutable and um, your judgments are past finding out. And so help us to attend carefully today to all that you um, make known in your word to test certainly our confession with what the scriptures teach about election and uh, predestination and those left to justice. Uh, Father, we thank you for Christ, uh, the Savior of sinners. May we look to him and see your glory on display in all your purposes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So let's, let's look at, um, let's look in, we're looking at the Westminster Confession of Faith. We're in God's eternal decree, chapter 3. And we're going to have these wonderful guest teachers the next couple weeks. But let's look at 3.1. So you have two sides here. Uh, on the back should be free will, because there's a lot of questions about free will. I know that's jumping the gun to a little bit later in the summer. We're going to cover free will, but I know there's a lot of objections about God's eternal decree, and how does that leave us with the ability to choose? Are we robots? So I included that, you know, just for for GP. So let's look at 1, uh, 3.1. It says, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own freely and unchangeably uh, will, freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Here's three qualifiers. Notice, yet so, thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is a liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. And so we're jumping into the fray with these. (laughs) The two main principles of theology are going to be this. It's going to be God. Whoops. God. And then all, all things in relation to God. Does that make sense? So Basically, creator, redeemer, and then creation. But... There's nothing that's not in relation to God. He's holding all things together by the word of his power, whether he's numbering the hairs on your head or sparrows are, are breathing their last as they fly through the air. All things are in relation to God. And he orders all things according to, it says, there's a couple words. It says that his will, when you think of God's will, um, it's wise. And of course it mentions Holy. And when you think of God's knowledge of all things, like God knows all things, He knows what? The end from the beginning, and then everything in between. Yet He's ordained ends, and yet He's ordained means. Did you catch a secondary cause action in that first? That's like almost Aristotelian philosophy. Why are they including that? Well, they're making the case that God doesn't work directly and immediately, but He often uses means and secondary causes, things according to their nature, to accomplish his most wise and holy will. And so let's look in this, um, in this, in this section here. The three things that they put guardrails against. You think of fences. They're trying to not necessarily protect God, but they're trying to protect us from speculation or going off the revealed path. And the first is that what? God is not the author of sin. Did you catch that? Like he freely, he unchangeably, ordains all things, like from eternity, his eternal purpose, according to the counsel of his will, where he foreordains whatsoever comes to pass. Good, bad, ugly, in between. And of course, that would beg the question, right? Well, there's sin, and God has clearly allowed it, or decreed it, willed it, purposed it, permitted it. That's a little sketchy, God, right? (laughs) 
And, and so the tendency would be to, of course, accuse God, but what, what they want to do is they want to make the case that what? As thereby, neither is God the author of sin. So that's the first qualification. So let's look at James real quick, because we have to let the, the this fancy things called the analogy of faith, or you, you, you basically use Scripture to interpret Scripture. That's one of the key um, principles for biblical interpretation is to let scripture let clear passages shed light on more difficult passages so let's look here in james james obviously it's a wonderful book one of the main books that was the reason for how i got saved right he starts talking about sin and desire and death and i was like holy smokes i'm done for can't stop sinning tried to stop sinning for like a couple weeks you know couldn't stop sinning didn't hear the gospel yet didn't, I knew Jesus was like loving and kind and good, but I didn't hear life, death, resurrection. I was left with James for a couple weeks. God totally humbled me. And, and yet this thing in chapter 1 was very uh, eye-opening, heart-illumining, um, soul-enriching. And it says this about, about uh, God here in James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say, here's the verse here, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So those two principles, right? Number one is what? God cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself tempts no one. So those, those are the two principles. God doesn't tempt anyone. He can't be tempted by evil. And you think of... Um, What's that, 1 John 1, 5? It's such a great verse. It talks about God in Him. God is light. In Him is no darkness. And like quite literally in the Greek it says, no way. <laughs> no way. No darkness. He is light. I probably should just read it rather than, than just paraphrasing it. But um, you use these clear scriptures. This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Like literally it's like no way. No darkness. God is light. God is truth. God is good. And yet God is sovereign and has decreed um, a lot of nitty gritty. A lot of goodness. A lot of beauty. Salvation. Uh, trauma. Abuse. Like nothing is outside of God's sovereign hand or purpose. So when you think is God the author of sin? The answer of course is absolutely not. You think of Acts chapter 3, verse 5, when they're preaching that it says God's the author of life, right? Chapter 3, verse 15, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, chapter 12, verse 2, God is what? The author of salvation and the author and perfecter of our faith. And yet he's not the author of sin. And so when, when you think of, um, let's look at John 19, because this, this kind of, we're looking at clear passages and now we're getting to, of course, the nitty gritty of Pilate. Remember Pilate? Pilate's in kind of a difficult situation because it's Passover and Jews galore in Jerusalem. And everyone and their brother, as my late mother would say, right? Everyone's there. And of course, Pilate has to keep things from getting out of control because if things get out of control, someone's going to pull his card and he's going to get deposed from his position. And so everyone's in a little bit of an uproar because of Jesus. He's kind of cleansed the temple, right? He's driven out some money changers. And people claim he's a prophet. Others say, you know, he's a heretic. Some say he's the Messiah. Well, you know, what's, what's Pilate going to do? And the Jews are at fever pitch wanting Pilate to what? Crucify him. And so when you skip ahead to John chapter 19, look in uh, verse 11. This is kind of during the preliminary uh, discussion. If you look, we'll start maybe in, in chapter 8. Jesus is kind of giving him the silent treatment. And the Jews are really worked up, right? Uh, look at verse 6. When the chief priests and officers saw him, remember, Pilate, what's happened to Jesus? He's been flogged, the crown of thorns. And you think of the flogging, right? Often they would attach them to a pole, arms up here, a lot of whips, like broken bones. The guy would just flail away. I mean, you saw maybe the movie where he was like maybe bent over on a rock or something like that. Usually they were kind of standing and just meleeed. And you think Pilate probably goes the extra mile with this one. To try to satisfy the Jews, doesn't want to crucify him, wants to let him go, but the Jews aren't satisfied with that. Verse 4, Pilate went out again and said to them, see, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know I find no guilt in him. I mean, after roughing him up big time, big time, and then some. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, 
Behold the man! When the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to, to them, <laughs> Pilate's so, such a wise, shrewd politician, right? Look at this. Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law. According to that law, he ought to die because he's made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He enters his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus said to him, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Okay, that's really a wild scene. Who's the above? It almost seems like it's the one who delivered Jesus over to him. Who was the one who delivered Jesus over to Pilate? Ultimately, the Father, right? But of course, the Father's not guilty of the greater sin, right? And back to Elder Jaime's point, is the authority from above is ultimately God's like eternal purpose to the praise of His glorious grace, to magnify His grace and His justice and His glory in the person of His incarnate Son. Like that's really, when you think of the eternal decree, we can get so bogged down in, okay, our salvation, hey, maybe someone's, you know, left handed over to their own sin. Maybe I wish I had a different life. <laughs> like what's, what's the ultimate goal of the decree? The praise of God's glorious grace, the manifestation of His glory in Christ, that in all things He might be preeminent. That's the words of the Apostle in Colossians. So when we start talking decree, don't get so bogged down into, okay, God's will, what's a will, what's my choice? Like Christ is, is, the, is the preeminent one. He's the, the center of, of all creation. and rede- It's the Holy Trinity, of course. But the glory of God's on display in Christ, the Creator and the Redeemer. And so when you think of God h- handing Him over, remember He was, uh, Isaiah talks about, you know, smitten by God, right? Or what does it say? It's 53.10. I should have it in my notes. I didn't put it in the notes. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief, right? You're like, wait, what? Didn't Pilate and the Jews, aren't they shouting out this? Well, yes. And the Lord's using very uh, shrewd, uh, power-hungry politicians and very deceived, hardened religious leaders. And yet he's not making them power-hungry and zealous for their own platform that they'll condemn an innocent man even after his wife says, hey, you have nothing to do with this man. I have terrible dreams. Yeah, thanks, baby. But you know what? I want my position and this is how we put food on the table. I'm going to hand him over, then I'll wash my hands, right? So in other words, God is sovereign over all things, but he uses things according to their nature. He's not the author of sin. And of course, the Jews, Judas, greater sin. Because Judas was with them three years, basically. Skimming a little off the top, but saw the miracles, heard the words, and then uh, betrayed him with a little smooch for 30 pieces of silver. That's a great sin. Pilate wasn't there seeing all the miracles, this, that, and the other thing. But he was face to face with the incarnate Son of God, and what is truth, he said. Right, remember? For this reason I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. What is truth? You know, it's like such a... That's a, that's a great, I mean, it's, it's, our, it's our culture in a sense. What is true? Oh, it's true for you, it's true for you, it's true. I just want to be happy and, you know, I mean, incarnate son of God. It's a little silent treatment here. And of course, Jesus, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. Like, basically, Pilate's used to people doing what? When they're caught in the crosshairs and about to be crucified, they've just been flogged. Yeah, let me off the hook. I got some money. I got some friends. Like, get me out of here. I'm guilty, whatever. Just, you know, spare me. And Jesus is just like poised. And of course, he's suffering greatly, body and soul. Like, I have a baptism to be baptized with how distressed I am until it's accomplished the will of the Lord to crush him. Like some mysterious, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The cry of, of the beloved incarnate son. Like, mysterious, Right? And, and yet, when we think of God not being the author of sin, and yet sovereign over all things, that's like a, a really clear example. Pilate's just in the horizontal sphere. I got this power, I got that power. And Jesus, like, you know, there's authority from above. Sober-minded. Um, any comments or questions about God not being the author of, of sin? Go ahead, jump on in. Be led by what his 
bad thoughts tell him to do when he does what his bad thoughts tell him to do, he, he sins. Is that like the NLT of James 1? I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. I was wondering if you were speaking in tongues back there. I didn't recognize that translation, but I, res I respect it. Read. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I can say that because you're one of my, my favorite people. So um, that's a great line, right? God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Like, he's not the author of sin. Go ahead, Larry. from the being tempted perspective, not the tempter perspective. Does, does that make any sense or not? Yeah, so obviously the language as it's, uh, what is the scriptures? And it's Luke 4, right? Matthew 4. Um, For 40 days being tempted by the devil and he ate nothing during those days, right? I mean, yeah. Whoa, James, didn't you read Luke? Like, haven't you talked to him? You guys, is that, like, too far from one another? Maybe you should get together, get your story straight. So, remember, the point Pastor was making last week is Christ is, what? One person, two natures. Now, true God, true man. And Christ is certainly, the devil is doing temptations. Christ is tested. The devil leaves him until an opportune time, if you read after he endures all those temptations or those tests. What is the test? Like, there's a lot of people who think, is he, is he, like, <laughs> is he on the razor's edge of giving in? Oh, he's going to go this way, that way. And if, you know, and if, he, if he does, if he's not like that, because that's how we live our lives every day. If we're really self-aware of sin and pride, you know, greed, covetousness, it's not just the big sins that are so obvious that we like never commit or you know, we're on the razor's edge invoking, Lord, help me. My help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Praise God. Is that like the same? Tempt no, we have a sinful nature. Jesus did not have a sinful nature. And so the other, the other thing is, is, it, is he just going through those temptations, pulling the divinity card, the incarnate son of God nature, like a mighty mouse or Popeye with the spinach. Boom, no piece of cake, right? You know, gun slinging Satan. You're done for. Scripture versus this and that. Was it just an automatic... Uh, a pre-incarnate download into the womb of the Virgin Mary of those verses in Deuteronomy that he's going to pull from in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. Thanks, I got the incarnate download, right? No, I mean, he's a true man. He grows in wisdom and favor of God and with man. Like, he truly grows. Knowledge that he acquires like us, and yet, of course, he's sinless. IQ off the charts. No corrupt nature. Holy Spirit who gives amazing grace when you think of the Spirit's role in the incarnate ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like if it's by the Spirit of God, I cast out what? Demons, then what's happened? The kingdom has come upon you. Like he doesn't just say, no thanks Holy Spirit, I'll do this according to my incarnate divine nature. No, it's, he does things, the, the eternal Son, the incarnate Son acts there's true communion, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, eternal, co-equal. But the redemption and the, the mission, what is it called? A ministry of humiliation. The, the Holy Spirit has so much to do with that ministry of humiliation for his growth and grace. For the remember he goes back into his hometown and barely and he goes back into his hometown and it says he marvels at their unbelief. Remember? And it says he can't do a lot of miracles there. Something to that effect. You can read it. And you're thinking, can't or won't, right? Which one is it, Jesus? You know, of course, go read the chapter and call me on it next week. I'll be away on vacation. You won't be able to call me on it. <laughs> because of their unbelief. In other words, the Spirit, Father, Son, and Spirit weren't bringing about like great miracles and, and flash and pizzazz, new kingdom, new creation, miracles of healings and restoration, even a lot of teaching. All in his hometown of prophets without honor. Like, was he handing them over to judgment? Like, it's kind of sobering. God is not the author of evil. Is Jesus tested? Absolutely he's tested. What is the test, though? 
Is it not to lust after Mary Magdalene? No. <laughs> What's the test? Throughout the whole earth, is it, is it not to like steal out of the money bag like Judas? No, class, you know it's not that, right? But that's kind of how we're tested or tempted sometimes. So how can he really relate to us? Is it just fake language? Being obedient to the Father or not? Yeah, it was uh, obviously the, en- the end goal, right? Which was the fathers will have food to do that you know not, not anything about. Remember in John 4, he's talking to the woman at the well, and it's to do the Father's will. And the will, of course, is to certainly bring about the, the signs of the new creation and the kingdom, healing, restoration, renewal, forgiveness of sins, but it's to, do, to be able to redeem a people for himself. And the test was, of course, to turn aside from that. But as he endures those tests, he's not on the razor's edge of going one way or another, but he sincerely is overwhelmed at times, remember? I'm overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Oh, are you, do you really mean that? Aren't you the incarnate Son of God? How does that happen to you? You're sinless. No, true humanity in every way, yet without sin. So he's able, it says he sympathizes, or he's able to give help to the offspring of Abraham. It's not angels he's helps, but the offspring of Abraham. He's like his brothers in every way. And so it's not that he's on the razor's edge, ready to go off the deep end, kind of like, we might, or the shallow end. I don't know your sins, right? But it's, it's to pursue the Father's will and to accomplish that redemption. And it's a very Trinitarian ministry of humiliation. Only do what I see the Father do. Do it in the power of the Spirit. Really, that's probably the best way to understand it. And of course, it's the incarnate Son who does it and who suffers fully as God in flesh, right? According to His human nature. Any comments or questions, though? Um, Obviously, that's a big one. God doesn't tempt anyone. So, what's up with Pilate and the religious leader Jews? When you think of God's decreed all this, did he make them have an evil will? That's the next, that's the next question, right? God is neither the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of creatures. That's a great thing you think of, um, remember, back with Pharaoh. Pharaoh hardens his heart, God hardens his heart, and you're like, God, hard, can't we just like, take that out of the Bible? That seems like bad. God, don't do that. Don't harden the heart of Pharaoh. That seems like an evil thing. And there's this great scene, you think even, um, maybe it's, <laughs> this is not even in my notes, so forgive me. You can question me on this. This is probably bad. Remember Ahab's a really wicked king? I think it's Ahab. And um, they're at war and they want to go to war with someone. And I think it's maybe Jehoshaphat or someone comes up from Judah. <laughs> and Ahab's got all these yes men prophets around him. And they're like, hey, should we go take this guy out? And all the prophets are putting on their fake horns. They're charging around. They're like, yeah, God's going to give you victory. Go do it. Go do it. And of course, the, the kingdom in the south, Judah is not as, a, not as hard-hearted and callous as like wicked king Ahab, whoever the king is. It's in king somewhere. And uh, he's, he's like, uh, you know, we're going to go to war together. All these prophets are dancing around saying, yeah, yeah, we're going to get victory. Go do it. And he's like, hey, do you have any real prophets around here? Remember Ahab says, I got one guy, but you know, never, never prophecies good, only evil concerning me. And I think it's Jehoshaphat says, well, you know, let me, let's bring him out. Let's bring him out, okay? And then so uh, Ahab's muscle brings him out. He says, hey, you know, tell him what he wants to hear, right? And so sure enough, he prophesies, tell him what he wants to hear. And Ahab's like, you're going to get victory. And Ahab's like, wait, wait, this guy's never said a good word to me about anything. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Right? And, and he says, yeah, you're going to die. Right? <laughs> and then, so you, then you get a behind the scenes look at this eternal council. And, and basically what happens is God's saying, uh, you know, who's going to judge Ahab? Right? It's this eternal council. You think angels, demons, like spiritual arena, pre cross where Satan and demons, boom, like, you know, these people are coming, accusing Job, right? Or God says, have you considered Job, right? And of course, Satan's there. Same thing with Ahab, like the council, these wicked demons are there. Who's going to be, who's going to, you know, get Ahab? I will, someone goes forward. How are you going to do it, God says? I'm going to put a deceitful spirit in the mouth of his prophets, gas him up, make him think he's going to get victory. And you're like, God, like, what are you doing? Well, God didn't create the deceitful spirit within this demon. God didn't create the deceitful spirit and the lying spirit within Satan and his minions that just want death and destruction. God didn't override the will of the creature, but he uses things according to their nature. So this deceitful demonic spirit 
wanted death and destruction. And of course, God's going to use this deceitful demonic spirit according to his most holy ends, which is judgment on a wicked, profligate, apostatizing, idolatrous king and gas him up with all his yes men prophets and then, you know, fail to take heed to the true prophet and then still go in, go in for glory on the battlefield. And so God doesn't offer violence to the will of creatures. And of course, I included, you see the confession, I'm talking a lot. It's on the back of your confession, chapter 9, of free will. So it's a shorter one. And so let's talk about freedom of will, because that's often a big objection, isn't it? Um, it says people have natural liberty. Uh, three things. It's not forced, nor by any absolute necessity of nature determined to good or evil. So it's a natural liberty. Obviously, Adam and Eve, too, had freedom and power to will and do that which was good and well-pleasing to God. You catch that in two? Yet mutably, so they might fall from it. And then here's three, though. This is interesting in three. Man, by his fall into a state of sin, hath wholly lost the ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man, being altogether averse from that good and dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. So God, when you think of free will, right? Because that's a big objection when we think of um, the divine decree. What is the best way to understand free will? Um, is someone who's not in Christ, who's in, in sin, is their will free or not free? It's almost like a trick question. They're free to sin. <laughs> okay, yeah. They're not free to will any spiritual good, it says. Therefore, that demon who, who goes, you know, sauntering in front of Ahab certainly cannot will any spiritual good. Yeah, he wants to accuse God's people. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy. So the best way to understand free will, maybe not the best way, is a natural liberty. What do I mean by that? We think of Pilate washing his hands, the Jews yelling, crucify him. It's a liberty or a freedom to will according to your nature. So all things will according to their nature for the most part. For the most part, all part. I want to be careful. You have a corrupt nature, unregenerate nature. Can you will any spiritual good? No, freely you don't wear, wear, uh, will any spiritual good. Can you seek God? No, no one seeks God, right? Can you help old ladies across the street and... Be great at your job? Absolutely you can, right? But it's a, it's a natural liberty to will according to your nature, so that begs the question, what is the nature, right? And God doesn't offer violence when you think of it, nor is violence offered to the will of creatures. That's a key qualifier in this eternal decree. God doesn't Indian burn people to make them do evil. When you think of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, which is one of the most sobering couple chapters in all of scripture he's like yeah yeah i'll let you go no 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 yeah yeah like is he is he just i'm gonna lie to moses in his face and then i'm gonna switch it up no he's so double-minded he wants him to go but then he's like well i'm gonna lose my workforce and then things are gonna be harder for me and my people no i changed my mind like his heart is so hard and when you think of god hardening his heart how how do you think god hardens people's hearts class it's not just like one answer. Let's have a discussion. Does it seem evil for God to harden hearts? At first glance, it seems a little iffy, doesn't it? If you're honest, maybe you're super great with your theology. You're like, I have no problem with that. I wrestled with that five years ago. <laughs> it, it seems iffy if God's going to harden hearts. Let's think of the human heart. Remember, what does the conscience do? It, it accuses or excuses behavior. Bad job. Good job. Right? Romans 2. It says that God's written His law in our heart. We have a general sense of right and wrong and what's pleasing to God and honoring to other people. And, and God, in a great way, restrains people from being very bad by giving conscience and this, this natural, the law written on the heart so that people have a sense of good. And He, he can preserve that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a non-redemptive way and give people great light of nature. You know people who are really virtuous and good? You're like, that's amazing. You know, you don't know the Lord yet? That's amazing. Because by God's grace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they've formed habits and dispositions, certain genetics, and, and pretty good. Not, not spiritually justified or right with God, 
but they're good. But when you think of God hardening someone's heart, all he has to do is remove like his, his restraining or a natural illumination or light or goodness. And that heart becomes like, well, that's erasing, that's bad. It becomes pitch black. Is that You follow that? So it's not God saying, let me make it pitch black. It's God saying, let me just remove a little bit of my triune, common, like sustaining, illumining gra- grace. And then the heart's boom, dark. Go ahead. I think Paul calls it giving them over. God giving them over to their sinful nature. Great point. Great point. And praise God he didn't do that to us. Oh, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Like he doesn't give us over to us. He doesn't even, you know, he doesn't even treat us as our sins deserve in Christ. Now it's so glorious. And when you think of that, it doesn't just mean no condemnation for you in Christ Jesus. Like so often he he in his grace and goodness and mercy, he keeps us from reaping what we sow. In his kindness, he brings us to repentance. Like his mercy is so great and so wonderful. I know I'm just trying to not excuse God, but help you understand how he doesn't offer violence to the will of creatures. And of course, our will is what? It's, it's free to obey. Our hearts are regenerate. We're able to will spiritual good to invoke God's name, to walk by faith and not by sight, to obey commands. It's so beautiful. And it's all in His decree. And yet, He doesn't override our will to make us do it. (laughs) We have this personal relationship and great liberty in our stations in life to shine and be light and be wonderful and be faithful no matter the tests or the temptations or the past excuses we have for disobedience. Right, Larry, you want to jump in and then Raz? I don't understand your question. Bear with me, brother. Like, everything's very good after God creates everything. And then Satan saunters in the garden. So, there's clearly a fall in heaven in the spiritual realm before Adam and Eve are tested. But that isn't your question, though. Help me understand. Or is it your question? In the similar way Adam and Eve wanted to become like God, if you read, there's passages um, referring to these different kings of Tyre. I think it's maybe either Isaiah 14 or 28 and Ezekiel 14 or 28. It, it likens Satan to be wanting to become like the Most High, exalt himself above the throne of God. So it's the same way he tempted Adam and Eve, wanting to be like God, which isn't proper. Even, you know, the, the medieval Catholics, they, they talk a lot about, uh, we tend to think all angels are the same. Well, Michael's a little bit better than most of the others, right? The, the, the historical reflection on Satan or Lucifer was that he was you know, one of the ones that had amazing gifts as an angel. And he corrupted himself in his pride. And then he was cast down. So when you talk original sin, that's like very particular theological language for the fall of Adam and Eve. That doesn't mean the first sin. The first sin was, of course, in the spiritual realm with Satan and the demons. We're going to keep, keep going unless you have any... Raz, did you want to jump in too? Yeah, I was with the brother over there with uh, Romans 1.28. The, I think the key is that they, did, they didn't want to acknowledge God and then he gave them over to yeah. their reprobate mind. Yeah, one twenty eight's a great verse. When you think of it, um, even one thirty two, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Like, why do people give approval to other things? So they, <laughs> they want to be blessed in what they do, like, and among other things, right? Some people, they can't sleep until they've, you read some of the uh, Proverbs. They can't even rest until they've done evil. It's like sobering. Really sobering, right? Like, we have such a 
iffy times in America, but we have a fairly wonderful society as it relates to law and order for the most part in our homes and day to day with where we live, okay? Most of the world isn't like that. Most, some of our, everyone, our nation's not like that. But there's people who can't sleep unless they've committed evil. We read in the Proverbs earlier this month, sobering thought, right? And they know God's righteous decree, and yet they give approval to those who go against it. So to Raz's point, it's, it's, um, it's a provocation of God's judgment when you suppress the truth and unrighteousness. He's just going to hand you over. Have at it. And, and in his sovereign, mysterious decree, he uses good and evil and everything in between to accomplish his most uh, wise will. And when you think of the knowledge of God, knowledge of everything that comes to pass, the wisdom of God is... is, is tended to be understood as how he orders those things. As it relates to God and all things not God, the way he orders all things not God to their appropriate ends, which is to the praise of his glorious grace and which is to magnify the supremacy of Christ, as Colossians says, in all things. Um, and that doesn't mean the way you think it should be. <laughs> just want to make that clear. You know that, but you must be reminded of that all the time. It's not about you or me. It's about Christ, and yet that means it is about us in a certain sense because God's included us in that wonderful plan. Gifts, callings, abilities, evils that we face, good and stations that we're able to do. Like, He includes us, so it is about us. Not ultimately, we're not the center. Christ is. And if we lose sight of Christ being the center and not us and His glory, then what? Then as soon as you know, things aren't revolving around our solar system, what are we doing? Gnashing our teeth at God and everyone else. Rather than, let me just trust your decree. So let's move on to the salvation aspect of this. Um, I want to look, look at 1.8, right? Look at, look at the warning in 1.8 that they issue. This doctrine, the doctrine of this high mystery of predestination is to be handled with special prudence and care. That men attending the will of God revealed in His word and yielding obedience thereunto may from the certainty of their effectual vocation be assured of their eternal election, so shall this doctrine afford matter of praise, reverence, and admiration of God, and of humility, diligence, and abundant consolation to all that sincerely obey the gospel. What does it mean to obey the gospel, class? You know what it means to obey the gospel? It means to believe it. And certainly once you believe the gospel, you ever have your cage rattled? Am I really saved? How could I do that? Or how could I feel this blueness of soul if I was really God's child. Like, I feel alone. My, remember the, the language in the psalm? My closest companions have become what? Darkness. Like, I've walked through that. I'm sure you, many of you have been through that, if not all of us at certain times. And we're thinking like, not just how long, oh God, but really God? Am I really your child, oh God? Or if you've sinned and done something terrible, like, how could I do that? I know better. And then you, maybe the blueness goes with that. Or maybe it's just a dis, an orientation of your soul for whatever reason. And you can really wonder, am I really God's child? Well, the worst place you can go, maybe not the worst place. There's a lot of bad places you can go. You can go away from God. But if you just go to the decree, if you just go to the decree, well, it says I was chosen before the foundation of the world. That's not going to provide you a lot of comfort. It's not going to provide you a lot of comfort. Listen to what Calvin says. If you're ever doubting your election, where should you go? Christ. Very good. Yes. Yes. He, his language is that Christ is the mirror of your election. Like, look to Christ. Like, the thing is, you're blue. I, I get it. I'm not making light of your blueness or your stumbling in your sin or how bad you feel. You must look to the object of your faith in all his glory. His incarnate humiliation as He endures evil, as He's forsaken, you may feel forsaken. As He suffers for your sins. Like, you must look to Him. Not to some feeling, or not to some act of contrition, or even great sin. Listen to what Calvin says. If we have been chosen in Him, remember, He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons. So glorious. If we have been chosen in Him, which is Jesus, we shall not find assurance of our election in ourselves. Don't ever forget that. And not even in God the Father. Whoa. 
Don't, don't look just to God the Father either. Just the naked God the Father without an incarnate mediator, beloved Son in whom you are chosen is bad news. God is good. He's not safe to sinners. Especially who want to just run right into His presence apart from the mediator, an incarnate mediator who suffered so greatly for your sin. We shall not find assurance of our election in ourselves, not even in God the Father, if we conceive Him as severed from His Son. Christ then is the mirror of our... Christ then is the mirror wherein we must and without self-deception may contemplate our own election. Oh, it's so good, right? <laughs> like without self-deception, you look at Christ and it's not just, you know, you look at the robust Christ, the incarnate suffering Savior, the one who's buried in the tomb to sanctify the graves of all those who deserve death. The wages of sin is death. You deserve it. And then what is that grave? It's empty. He's risen and victorious and exalted to the right hand of God and lives to intercede for you. That is the Christ like you look to. And you, you bow. What does he say? <laughs> Wherein we must and without self-deception may contemplate our election. Christian, you must and you may look to Christ, the whole Christ, as you contemplate your election. Or if you're looking for assurance. Go ahead. They're both good questions. And d- I, yeah, thank you. Man. Say some more. I think if you, you really are problematic if you try to get God behind God's thinking on his eternal declaration. You can't know what he knows. So you don't really know what you know. And do I believe in Christ in my testing him? My testing him? I, I love that. And that's half, that's half the coin of what you must believe. The other half, very Lutheran here. Obviously, reform, look to Christ, look in the gospel, his righteousness, his suffering, his death. Luther, the other half would say, look to yourself and your terrible sin. Am I a sinner? Do I believe that I'm a sinner? <laughs> yes, one of the worst ones in this room, right? <laughs> Absolutely you are. Believe that. Own it. And then know that Christ Jesus came for sinners, to your point. Like, don't just like look at, like the more you realize you're a sinner, know that Christ came for sinners, that he loves to save sinners and then just freely embrace him and rest upon him and receive him. And obviously, it's not like I'm scared of the eternal uh, election and then reprobation and passing over. It's not like I tried to dodge five and six. I'm not afraid of those class. Like, we'll get to those some other time. Um, but yes, l- you're looking at your sin. Don't be scared of it. Christ came for it. To satisfy the judgment of God fully and completely. Larry, you're going to get the last word, then we're going to sing to the Lord. I'll say that uh, according to my brother Barry Einhorn, he always says, saved by God, from God. Knowing that God saved me, but from his wrath that he put on Christ. That's so good. One, One more preposition too. Like, we need to be saved by God, from God. Or from God, by God. And of course... What do we say for? For God. Like, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but eternally, He's willed to be your Father through the Son and the Spirit in the Gospel. And that's to the praise of His glorious grace. So, so whether you feel or not that you're for God, well, you are, but you know without a shadow of doubt, as you look to your sin and then your Savior, that God is for you. And that is the final word of your soul, the eternal... Uh, the eternal judgment, the judgment from eternity future is broken in upon your life and your soul in the gospel and it's justified, not guilty, no condemnation. And therefore God is for you and you exist for God. And good, bad, and ugly and whatever may come, God will keep you uh, to the very end. Let us, let us pray and then we're going to sing. Which number is it? One, six, seven. Okay. Father, thank you for... Um, Thank you for our confession, Lord. These guys wrestled with Scripture's teaching about uh, such mysteries of your sovereignty and um, your great salvation. Uh, We thank you that Christ uh, is supreme over the creation, over the new creation, and over his church. Um, Thank you for being for us in the gospel and, 
And that who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Oh, so many, but it is you who justify. Who is he to condemn? May we not condemn ourselves. May we take refuge in Christ, who is the mirror of our election, the Savior of our, of our sins, Savior of ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.